Hey, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to the last message in this series on the mystery of the Ten Virgins. Now, I'm telling you, I'm sure you've seen it. I haven't covered all of it. I am telling you, there are so many mysteries wrapped up in this parable and the other parables about the last days. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the repetitive command for us to watch and pray. You know, we've, we've already talked about the fact that Jesus gave the command to hear what the Spirit is saying more than any other command that he ever gave. Now, if he's given us a command to hear, then the one thing that we know is we can hear then if we are willing to hear, if we actually want to hear. You know, in this parable of the Ten Virgins and the other parables that relate to the last days, we have a lot of warnings in here that we just totally overwork, overlook because we have relegated these parables just to be some kind of uh, stories about getting born again. They have nothing to do with getting born again. These are messages to the believers, not to the world. These are not messages to get people saved. These are uh, Jesus' teachings were messages primarily to teach us how to participate in kingdom living. Now, we've got all of these warnings. Uh, let me just read you just a few of the warnings. Don't let the day take you unaware, that day uh, of the Lord. Uh, another one says to, uh, to be ready. Another says always be sober or, or clear-minded. And, of course, we have the one that says uh, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, now, one of the interesting things about this is this is giving us a command that has to do with the fact that we do not want this time to catch us unprepared, or as the King James might say, unaware. You know, an uh, interesting thing about hearing in the Hebrew language, the word hear and the word obey is a continuum. And as a continuum, what we understand is this, is that anything that we would be unwilling to obey, we cannot hear and understand. Now, that's a pretty phenomenal thing. As a matter of fact, when there's something that we are not willing to obey, the real truth is our heart makes sure that we don't understand it. Understanding gives us a justifiable reason not to obey, not to pursue it, to waste time pretending like we're seeking something. The real truth is we should always be ready to obey anything God says because we fully and completely trust Him. So. We must be willing uh, to hear what we don't want to hear. Because if there's anything I am unwilling to hear, if there's anything I'm too afraid to hear, then I will never hear it in a way that I can actually understand it, grasp it, uh, and believe it. And so I am convinced that there are many things that we just don't want to hear based on uh, the teachings of the Lord Jesus in the scripture about the last days. Now, the reason we're afraid is because, number one, we don't understand them. Understanding is a capacity of the heart. It is not an intellectual capacity. And in understanding, we're able to take all of these truths and all of these different pieces, and we're able to bring them together. We're able to resolve the paradoxes, the seeming uh, conflicts uh, that that we, that we think that we're reading into these things. But the real truth is uh, we can get an understanding where suddenly all of this stuff becomes incredibly clear. But all of this gets resolved by going to the Scripture and by uh, continuing in an intimate relationship with the Lord where we're willing to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying and let Him become our teacher. Now, when we don't trust something, when we're afraid of something, when it, when when we don't want to understand it because of the, because of the fear that it creates in us, then we create doctrines to make us feel safe. And actually, doctrines. There's nothing evil about doctrines. We have to have doctrines, but doctrines do become evil when they become a substitute for personal involvement with the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have personal involvement with the Lord Jesus, if we have personal intimacy with him, he will teach us, not just teach us the doctrinal line upon line aspect of the word of God, but he will teach us 
how we are going to put this to practice in our life. And so all fear goes away when we know how we're going to function in it. And also, he will give us the grace, the power, the ability, the capacity to uh, function in this truth. You know, there's just a lot of what I call inconvenient doctrines. There's just doctrines that we we don't want to deal with. We don't want to take a deep dive. We're just afraid of what they might reveal. You know, when I first got saved, I attended a Baptist church for the first 18 months. I had a wonderful experience. I don't have anything bad to say uh, about that church. I stayed there until God uh, called me to to step out and go somewhere else, and I did. But I I would not trade anything for the 18 months that I spent in this Baptist church. Now, fortunately for me, and this doesn't just apply to the Baptist church I attended, but later on to the to the charismatic church that I attended. You know, I read the Bible myself before I ever went to church and continue to read the Bible continuously and prayerfully all the rest of my Christian life. So I wasn't looking to anybody to give me all the answers. I was looking for some clarification. I was looking to grasp things that I didn't know, but I ne- it didn't matter who the person was, how much I respected them. I never swallowed anything hook, line, and sinker. I always took it back and went to God and, and allowed the Holy Spirit to, to, to be my teacher. Now, in, in the Baptist church, they are Calvinists, and Calvinists believe that God is pretty much in control of everything, and he's not. Now, God is in control in the sense that he will keep working with people. Well, number one, he has seen the end from the beginning. And so he, he knows what the outcome is going to be. And he's going to continuously work with people who will walk with him so that he can accomplish his will on earth. But he doesn't get everything that he wants. It's not the will of God that anybody perish, but people perish every single day. Uh, it's not the will of God that anybody be in sin. It's not the will of God that anybody... Uh, be evil or wicked or murderous or in those things, but they happen every single day because man has a, a free will. And at the end of the day, Calvinists don't really believe man really has a free will. So Calvinists, they teach a doctrine called once saved, always saved. Now, let me just tell you what. People ask me, and they've asked me my whole ministry career, if I believed in once saved, always saved. And I'm like, you know what? Uh, I don't know if I believe in once saved, always saved. I believe in the security of the believer, but I don't necessarily believe and once saved, always saved. And they, they're like, well, what does that mean? Uh, my answer is go find out for yourself. Go seek God and get in a relationship. Let him teach you what that might mean if that is, is the truth. So one of the things I ran into in the Baptist church, I, I love the fact that in the Baptist church, they won people to Jesus. Man, I was, you know, when I gave my life to Jesus, my number one passion was to reach my generation with the gospel because, in fact, nobody was reaching my generation. So anyhow, the most important doctrine to a Calvinist is once saved, always saved. And I'll tell you, Baptists would argue with you about that. They would fight with you about that. They would not even consider any possibility that, that, there, was another, that there was another point of view. And so what I came to realize very quickly is that they were using this doctrine to give them a sense of security without really having to be intimate with God to discover a deep, deep sense of security. And that's what we do. We create doctrine to give us security that we're not willing to get through a deep personal relationship with God. And so really, doctrine can sometimes drive you away from God or alienate you from God because you're relying on it instead of relying on him personally. Now, the very first sermon, I never wanted to preach in church. Man, I was a, I, I went out and was a witness on the streets, went in people to Jesus one-on-one, and I did that for about three and a half years. And uh, so, you know, I started getting invitations to preach in churches. I, that wasn't what I was pursuing. It just, it just happened because I was bearing fruit. And so, the very first sermon that I ever preached in a church, uh, this church was, I mean, like I said, great church, but man, this church was filled with people that they want to fuss with you about once saved, always saved, all the time. And so I preached this message from the book of Hebrews. I'm not going to go into the whole thing. And Hebrews 10, 26, it says, if we willfully sin after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a fearful looking for an expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. 
Anyone who rejects the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment or worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the uh, the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified as a common or unholy thing and has, in, has insulted the Spirit of grace. Now, I didn't use that scripture to try to prove or disprove the doctrine of what saved, always saved. But what I did do is I used this to interject the fact that if there are scriptures like this in the Bible, and if we are not sure that we're understanding them, then we might have to consider that, wait, wait a minute, maybe maybe there is a security of the believer, but that doesn't necessarily mean once saved, always saved. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I don't really care because my security is not in that doctrine. And my, you know, my whole summation of this sermon and presenting the possibilities that some, that some of these scriptures, we may not be interpreting them properly, was this, that uh, nobody can answer that question because nobody's crossed over and come back and say, hey, I lived like a dog. I was a horrible person. I was immoral. I was ungodly, but I still got to heaven. We haven't had anybody come back to tell us that. And the honest truth is a person that, that it is their goal and their desire. And by the way, we have people today that believe in a version of the grace message that might as well be once saved, always saved. And in fact, that version of the grace message is rooted in Calvinism. And, and so through a faulty doctrinal definition of the word grace, uh, then people kind of get the idea they can't live however they, they want to live. Well, of course, you, you and I both know that indicates a much, much more severe problem than a doctrinal problem. Now, one of the things uh, I always tell you is, is when we ask the wrong question, we always get the wrong answer. By getting the wrong answer, I'm not saying it's the incorrect answer. I'm saying it's the wrong answer. It is the wrong answer that we need to meet the real need. The answer is not going to give us an unshakable security. It's going to give us an intellectual security. And so, so if I answer the question, yes, I believe in what I'd always say, I might get intellectual security, but I got news for you. There's always going to be something missing. And so I have to look at the scripture that says, well, well, wait a minute. Maybe there's another question that I have to ask. And at the end of my sermon that day, one of the questions I ask is this. I said, so maybe the real question you need to ask is not what saved, always saved. Maybe the real question you need to ask is, do I value my salvation enough to want to live a godly life? Do I value my influence on the world around me in a way that says I am going to live a godly life. Do I know and value what Jesus did for me on the cross and in the grave and through the resurrection? Do I value that enough that I, that I love him deeply enough to be faithful to him? And I don't really care if the doc, I don't even care if once I would always say it's true or not true. What I care about is I love my savior who paid this incredible uh, price for me. Am I in love with Jesus? Well, there are last day's teachings where we create and hold on to doctrines more than we hold on to God. And we have the same problem with this that the Baptists had with once saved, always saved, and that we want our doctrine to give us something that only the Holy Spirit can give to us. And when you go back and start looking at all of those warnings, it's like watch and pray be ready, be found worthy, all of these kinds of things about, uh, about the harpazo and even the second coming, so, suddenly we realize, well, wait a minute, there, there's something I'm missing here. This is bigger than just picking the doctrine that feels comfortable with me. In the Old Testament, there is a, a scripture that gives us how we start a journey that takes us into a life of understanding, not just the scripture, but understanding the ways of God. It moves us uh, into being able to grasp the knowledge of the Holy One. It brings us to a place to where we hate evil. We, ha we don't want to participate. We love righteousness. We, you know, we love this quality of life that we can have in God. 
And uh, and ultimately, it's it is the, where wisdom starts. And wisdom, by the way, is always about uh, the practical application of something that you actually believe in your heart. Well, this the whole church world has fallen apart uh, because despite all of the doctrines that we embrace and hold on to and fight with one another about, it's amazing how little people can actually get to work. Uh, in in the real life. Well, this thing that gives us that kind of preparation to be able to hear the voice of the Spirit, understand the voice of the Spirit, have understanding about the Scripture, have wisdom about how to put the Scripture into practice, the Bible calls that the fear of God or the fear of the Lord. Now, our problem is, uh, again, we have developed doctrines about the love of God Uh, that are very one-sided, that leave out the need for us to be in love with Him, that leave out all of the reciprocal things that happen because we're in a love relationship, and basically uh, have done with those doctrines much like the Calvinists did with the security of the believer. And we just turned it into a static, one-dimensional belief that says, well, well, no, we, we, we can't have any fear because the Bible says there is no fear in love. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says there's no fear in perfect love. And perfect love is a love that has been developed in our heart, and it has reached its goal, and it has become reciprocal. It's us receiving love from Him and us pouring love back into Him because of how we value Him. But in the, in the ancient world, the concept of the fear of God uh, wasn't just the idea that, oh, man, God might hurt me. God might do something bad to me. No. You know, the word fear itself in the Hebrew uh, speaks of a fear, an awe, and a respect that leads to love and worship. It doesn't go to the place of I'm afraid he's going to kill me. I'm afraid he's going to hurt me. It goes to this place of love and respect. So how does fear pit fit into that? Well, according to the ancients, this concept says that the thing that I fear the most would be anything that would hurt my relationship with God. And and, and I fear that more than I fear man. I fear that more than I fear what's coming on planet Earth. I fear that more than anything. And because I know that God is good and God's only good, I may not be able to answer all these questions doctrinally, but I know in my heart, God's always going to protect me. He's always going to be my delivery deliverer. He's always going to help me in my, in my time of need. So, so I, I have to look at these scriptures and say, man, it would make me feel a lot safer if some of these mysteries, uh, if we already had the understanding to them. There's a lot of them we don't have the understanding to right now, and we won't have the understanding until the time comes that we absolutely need them more than we than we need anything else. Hey, you know, I think about the fear of God is like it's sort of like the fear of hurting my relationship with my wife. You know, this is the most important relationship in the physical world that I have ever had and ever will have. And I'm more concerned about hurting that relationship by being unkind. It's, it's not the fact that being I fear that being unkind will will make her hate me. I I fear that being unkind will make her will hurt her and will her ultimately hurt the relationship. I'm not I'm I'm not afraid that if I do something wrong with God, then suddenly He's going to be against me or make me pay some kind of penalty. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about this is the one thing I would fear being without more than anything else is this intimate relationship with God. So when I look at scriptures that have some kind of nebulous uh, truth in them, I can't just choose a doctrine that's going to make me feel secure. Uh, I've got to choose. I've got to choose whatever I choose. And sometimes I have to admit, I don't know. I just don't have a clear cut answer. But I can tell you this, whether I have a clear cut answer or not, I am going to protect this relationship. So, you know, Jesus put it this way, Matthew 6, 33, uh, and, and, and in Matthew 6, we lift this out of context. He talks about the person that's kind of gets their heart set on their trust in riches. So their trust in riches says, you know, I'm going to be secure and I'm going to be safe because of these things. 
And so this becomes a substitute for God. And we do the same thing with our doctrine. I'm going to be safe. I'm going to be secure because I embrace these doctrines. Therefore, those doctrines become a substitute for God. And this is why, and you go and read Matthew chapter 6, starting, you know, with with how Jesus talks about, about you can't serve, you know, two masters. And one of them's going to be, one of them's going to be this, whatever it is, doctrine, money, material possessions, or whatever, that's giving us a false sense of security instead of looking to him as our absolute source. And so that's why in Matthew 6, 33, he said, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of this will be added to you. You don't really have to pray about this other stuff. God knows you have these needs. You don't have to waste your time seeking it. Set your heart on the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I'm telling you, if that's where your heart is, uh, then you are in that place where you are putting your relationship with God, you are putting the kingdom of God first in your life. And so God's going to lead you. God's going to direct you, even if you don't have the answers right now, even if you don't understand it. Stop and think about the fo- the foolishness of the five virgins is, you know, it's not just the fact that they weren't ready. It was the fact that they didn't follow instructions. They didn't value what God was telling them. They didn't value what the bridegroom was telling them enough to prepare. It was not a priority in their life. They didn't put that first. So this means they didn't watch and pray. It means that they didn't hear what the Spirit was saying. And then whenever they, whenever they were caught unprepared, they wanted someone else to be responsible for bringing them oil. They wanted, instead of them getting prepared, they wanted somebody else to bring it to them. And, you know, we have that kind of false concept where somebody else can lay hands on you and give you their anointing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, not so much. You know, in the, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31, which is quoted in, in Romans, uh, Romans chapter 10, uh, you know, Moses and the apostle Paul said, don't ask who's going to go get this and bring this to us. Don't ask or reply that you need anybody to make this understandable to you. Nobody's got to go and get this for you, but the word of faith is near you even in your mouth. He says the word of faith, which we preach, and the word of faith is that we take the word of God and we believe it, and we believe it from the perspective that God is, is a good and dependable God. So they wanted somebody else to, to meet the need that only God can meet. So you start looking at these parables, and you're like, well, wait a minute. You got a parable where it talks about one person's taken and another person's left behind. You got another parable about, uh, about the wise and faithful servant versus the evil servant. It's kind of interesting. That word evil, in that case, means to withdraw or retreat in battle. This is the person who runs from the conflict. And the wise one, according to Jesus' teaching over in Matthew chapter 7, is the one who builds their house and establishes their heart on the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. So all of this is to say what we try to get from our doctrine, we're never going to get it. You see, there, there may be things about the harpazo we don't understand. There are some people that don't believe in the harpazo. That's their choice. But even though it's in the Old Testament, even though Jesus taught it, even though the Apostle Paul taught it, even though the Apostle John taught it, uh, and so it's all, it's, it's all over the Scripture, so it's there, period. But you know, there's some people that don't believe it, and there's some people that believe it. They will fight you over pre-tribulation rapture. There are people that will fight you over post-tribulation rapture. There are people that will fight you over mid-tribulation rapture. Well, I can tell you this. Uh, there, you, can, you can explain all of those from Scripture. So that means, oh, wait a minute, there must be something I'm not understanding. But I'll tell you what I do understand. I do understand the love of God. I do understand that God is my Savior. He is my deliverer. He, he protects me. He is my he is my shield. He is my rear guard. He, uh, he, I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. His rod and his staff cover me. So all of that is absolute. And even though I don't understand all of these things about the, about the rapture, see, that there, there is a possibility that what we call the rapture or the Bible calls the harpazo, 
that there could be a subset of people that do get raptured at the beginning of the tribulation and another subset of believers that get raptured in mid-tribulation. There is that possibility. I'm not saying it's true, but what I'm saying is when there are possibilities of different, of different answers, you turn to the one thing that's absolute, and that is who is God? Do you trust God? Is he good? Is he only good? Is he your protector? Is he your deliverer? Listen, I want to encourage you, download my series right now on the mystery of the 10 virgins. I'm telling you what, it, 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 you got hours and hours, and particularly when you couple it with these videos, and, and these are not the same. They're not identical. I never, I, I never have identical messages in the video and in the audio. I want to give you as much as I can possibly give you. But we want to come to that place to where our heart is settled in the goodness of God, not in uh, the assurance of our doctrine. Now, it's great when you get doctrine settled, but you know what? You can have peace and you can have confidence without assurance. And you don't have to become dogmatic. You don't have to become argumentative. You don't have to force everybody. You know, people who need to force other people to believe their doctrine, they're doing it because they're insecure. And, and if you don't agree with them, then that robs them of their security. But remember this, whenever you purchase from any of our products, that gives us resources to establish Bible schools all over the world. You know, this year we're going to have, I don't we don't even know how many, we know of about a thousand Bible school students that graduate this year in various countries of the world. And we actually know of other places where we have Bible schools where thousands of people graduate every single year. Help me take this message to the end of, of the earth. Help me get people connected to God more than they're connected to the doctrine. Be sure and go to uh, my website, uh, my website impactministries.com or drjimrichards.com and jump on and become a world changer with us. I'll tell you, we will keep reaching people and sharing the good news until the last day that we can and the last day that we're here on planet Earth. I hope you've enjoyed this series. I hope it encourages you. And I got a great series that's going to be starting for you next week. So I look forward to it. Blessings to you.